Don't you love it when you uh, tweet and misspell somebody's name in the tweet and then people start retweeting you're like, no! Oh! How did that happen? I've always had a, an issue with spelling uh, Gordon properly. Gordon? Yeah. Why? Why is this, does this come from some deep-rooted hatred of Gordon? No, I just always have an, an aberrant A in it. Spell Gordon? G-O-R-D-O-N. Correct. That's not something that I could do. And the reason I'm telling you this is because we were talking about Gordon Darcy. He's written a really good piece in the Irish Times today. Donald Lennon has written a good piece in the Irish Examiner today. No prizes for guessing what they're talking about. They're talking about doping in Munster. Um, they're both making the point that there was no dope doping problem in Irish rugby until they uh, we managed to import one and that's Gordon Darcy's take on it and this is a mess all of Irish rugby's own making is the point that Donald Lennon makes. We'll talk about this story a good bit more a little bit later on. Um, I was going to start the show by saying you never know what it is that you're actually going to get sacked for in a job like this. Uh, we were talking about Paulie O'Shea on the back of Mikey Sheehy's comments about uh, Kerry fans not showing up in great numbers to the All-Ireland semi-finals and finals and so I was trying to remember the exact quote from Paddy in that famous interview with Marty Morrissey years ago down in Cape Town. Uh, what I could remember was the roughest type of effing animal. So type that into Google. The first one that comes up, first re uh, result is Gooch, the autobiography, Happy Days. The second one is a uh, Marty Morrissey reveals surreal details of Paddy O'Shea interview um, from 2017. And the third one, well, the third one's going to get me sacked from my job. Because if you put the roughest type of effing animals in Google, you get some pretty hardcore results. Is that so, just like your search history on that little thing there? That's just sort of influencing remove, things. Remove uh, cookies and um, yeah. So Paddy O'Shea, as as a, the resident carry man, Mikey Sheehy, touched a nerve this morning when he said that you know, glad the Mayo fans really showed up in, in great voice and great numbers to the semi final and the semi final replay. Mm -hmm. Kerry fans not so much. Yeah. Does this have an impact on the sideline? Yeah. The players notice this. There's silence around Croke Park. Our game, our season is on the line, and we're like, come on, just a little bit of help in the crowd. Yeah, he's he, he's not particularly wrong, especially when you compare the amount of supporters that they had uh, up against what Mayo have. You're always going to be dwarfed by Mayo or Dublin fans, but when it comes to Dublin, you're like, ah, fair enough, it's Crow Park, it's it's in their backyard, they can show up, and there's no travel costs or anything like that. But when it comes to Mayo, you're like, hmm, we have a higher population than Mayo. Uh, we is a lot of people would argue, actually, no, there is a prouder tradition of success than there is in Mayo. <laughs> there's no argument about that. But maybe that's the reason why. Maybe that you know, you're that, complacent. You don't care. It doesn't matter as much anymore. Precisely, particularly when it comes... the roughest type of effing animals. I guarantee you these effing animals will show up in full force this year if a Mayo Championship game is once again on the table. Because there was a complacency about Mayo. I voiced such complacency... About on, the semi-final game. About the semi-final yeah. game. But you would have liked to have thought that, come the replay, a lot of more people would have travelled because they realised that, uh-oh, this could well be the last game of the Championship. Yeah, I mean, you were obviously there doing your bit, screaming your county to success, right? Well, okay, here we go. I went... I went. What, what, no, the answer is yes, of course I was. I had to work that day. What? I was... So, uh, yes, you, you... I was in that radio studio during the replay. You I arranged for somebody else to cover your shift because it was the most important thing. that Your duty as a no, carrier was to be there that day. Because Nathan went. He got to go and said and support Mayo, <laughs> and he went to... He, hey, this is exactly the point. It's not that he's pulling rank or anything. It's like he's just he, a better no, fan. He literally is. I missed three Kerry games last year. I missed the McGrath Cup semi-final. I'm including the McGrath Cup here. I missed the McGrath Cup semi-final, Monaghan in the league, and the All-Ireland... The semi-final replay against me. I'm not angry about it. When they needed you most. When they needed me most. And you weren't there. Nathan Murphy Cock doing, doing three the good thing. The back and you're like, ah, sure. So we've we've 36 or is it 37? Who knows? Nathan, chairman of the whatever the Dublin Mayo supporters humans group, made sure that I wasn't allowed to go and support my team. That's what happened there. But yeah, I like that. There is a certain element of truth in what. She he is saying the, the the strength in what he's saying though is I, I think a tad harsh saying that it was embarrassing and shocking. Um, that's, that's not many Kerry people showed up. I, I'm not so sure about that. If there was embarrassment because of the, the lack of fans, I think there might have been embarrassment at what could have been in that game in the replay last year. Kerry could have got hockeyed by a lot more than they did get hockeyed. So the Kerry fans, i.e. you, are throwing shade at Mikey Sheehy for saying them not showing up was embarrassing. You're saying, no, you were embarrassing. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> I'm not saying, like... That's what you just said. Kind of, it, but it could have been a lot... I'm saying it could have been a lot more embarrassing. I'm not saying that. He says they should have got beaten by six points. 
Yeah, well, you see, the thing about it is, I, I would like, I would love to. We've got, we've got this coming up uh, graphic here, and we see Sheehy and O'Neill. Yeah, so yeah. that's Keane O'Neill, the Kildare manager, obviously Kildare in Division One. They start their campaign against Dublin. We're going to hear from him a little bit later on. He's been speaking with Oshin. But if you're a Kerry fan and you're annoyed, well, we'd love to hear from you because we don't have enough annoyed Kerry people on the show on a daily basis right here on OTV AM. What's your Twitter handle? I don't Sheehan. This idea, though, like this Mikey Sheehy thing that Kerry should have got beaten by six points, this is a load of crap, this idea that Mayo are head and shoulders better than Kerry. Did Just that day that he said they were already... And they, the, uh, oh, uh, sorry, we should stress that he's 100% accepting the blame yeah, exactly. for the decision-making that they got wrong in the sideline, their sweeper system. I can't actually remember the nuances of the semi-final replay now. Wasn't it Paul Murphy who was back as sweeper who had never played the position before? The, like... It, that's the frustrating, um, maybe borderline embarrassing thing about it, is that that shouldn't have happened. And I, I'm glad to see Sheehy putting his hands up and accepting it as a management team that there were a lot of errors made in that game. Leaving James O'Donoghue on the bench was probably the most glaring blunder of that occasion. And a result like that against Mayo, who, like, everybody was saying it after the game that, oh, Mayo are way better than Kerry. There's a clear pecking order. Dublin are the best. Mayo are second. And Kerry are lagging way behind Mayo. That is not the case. That's that a is. lot of crap. That is. That's well, a lot of crap. That's show not me true. the evidence that's otherwise. Well, but the, the evidence that's otherwise is that Kerry played really poorly and almost came away with the win in the first day. You're as good as your results. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't think that's true. Not in this case. I, I think Kerry massively underperformed both occasions. The second because of a, uh, what happened on the line to a certain extent. And they essentially got knocked out of the championship by, I wouldn't say a lesser team, but certainly not a team that are head and shoulders better than them, as some people would like to believe. Mm. It's something that still rankles at me. And, uh, the, the, there's nothing worse than underachievement, is all I'm saying. <laughs> 37 all Ireland. Who's 37? I'm speaking about you last year in a microcosm. Okay, all right. Uh, Pat Burke, NBA stories. He's been speaking with Owen. He is an Irishman, uh, born in Ireland, played in the NBA. Uh, there are questions, lots and lots of questions, all throughout the newspapers, and a bunch of questions that we are asking the IRFU and Munster Rugby today about the Kerbrand Cobbler situation, which refuses to go away. This, despite the fact the story really became a story over a week ago at this point. There have been massive European games in the intervening period, and still it is the main topic of conversation in all the press conferences in Leinster and Munster yesterday. So uh, it's this uh, subject of a bunch of columns today in the newspapers too. It is definitely the story that won't die at this point. Um, Comer McBrearty, two of the players, two of the uh, management team really, when it comes to she and O'Neill, we're going to hear from uh, Paddy McBrearty uh, talking about um, what Donegal's hopes are for this year and the fact that they didn't really want Rory Gallagher to go, but a new voice is actually working out quite well for them so far. And then we'll run you through the back pages. The big news, I guess, over the last uh, 24 hours in football, world football is that Ronald Gino has retired. Mm. Goodbye, Ronaldinho. Not that he was a relevant face in world football for the last, whatever, two or three years, but he, he went home, had his kind of long goodbye, which is probably what I would do if I was in his position. He's famously in love with his home country, famously likes to enjoy himself when he's home in Brazil, so he managed to do that while playing professional football for the twilight of his career. Did that come a little bit too early? Some people would say yes, that he definitely had a purpose to serve in Europe for a couple of more years, but screw it, he made his money. He's like, I love my country, I'm going home and I'm going to play as many years as, as I possibly can uh, in top-level Brazilian football. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I definitely yesterday I would have felt exactly the same thing, but talking about Anderson um, on the show, the point that was made was effectively that Anderson as a kid as a 16, 17 year old was scoring big goals and big games and uh, behaving like an adult. Um, just like a very long career. Maybe our expectation of the very few who managed to take it into their mid thirties at a very high level, um, they're the outliers. And actually the truth is that most footballers are done 30, 31 and then the last few years are playing out the string and that's what he's been doing. It's a fair point. Like there is certainly a possibility that Ronaldinho would have gone to a good club as opposed to an absolutely amazing club, which he was at at Barcelona. And then he is winning cup competitions, maybe challenging in Europe, but really he's done everything he wanted to do. He he'd skimmed the cream at the, at the top of the jar of uh, European football, and that's all he wanted. He had felt the best, and he's like, now it's time to enjoy myself, now it's time to cash in. And why not? I mean, like, of course your professional career is only so long, but it's still a, a fraction of your life. So Yeah, he's not going to go broke, no. I don't think. I think, uh, I think he's managed to manage his money properly. So some stories from last night, obviously. Uh, Martin O'Neill and the FAI 
released a video where O'Neill said that the details of his contract have been agreed but not signed. There are some, still some bits and pieces with the lawyers. We'll bring you that video a little bit later on and uh, we'll play it to you. Um, in the FA Cup last night, in the replays, West Ham got past Shrewsbury eight minutes from the end of extra time. A goal from Reese Burke gave them a 1-0 win. It was nil all at full time and uh, so it's either a trip to Wigan or Bournemouth for West Ham. They meet tonight and uh, last night at the King Park, Kalichi Iheanacho's goal was awarded by VAR. Mm. First goal in English football history to be awarded by the video assistant referee. Yeah, the first turnaround anyway. Um, it was a very interesting one, which I didn't quite understand. They beat Fleetwood 2-0, by the way. Yeah, the whole visual element of this, that the referee goes to the VAR, and then you, what you get is a lot of parallel lines on the pitch. So you've got a parallel line where Riyad Mahrez passes the ball, and then you've got a lot of other lines running parallel with that. Then you've got a line of a different colour, which is Kalichi Iheanacho's line. And for some reason, I don't know why people haven't done this on like match of the day before when you're getting, is he, isn't he offside? Because it makes it very clear that uh, Iheanacho is onside. It makes it a very easy decision for the VAR to come up with and get back to the referee and say, no, that, that was a, a legitimate goal and it was awarded. So this whole idea of uh, subjective, um, like the, the opinion nature of the VAR and how that will be a, a complete downfall of this thing, doesn't really apply to offside goals anyway, so it's, it's one good tick for VAR so far. It's going to be interesting, of course, when it does come down to a penalty, because that's the real subjective yeah. nature of things. Yeah, it's going to be Man City against Cardiff in the next round. Cardiff beat Mansfield 4-1. Anthony Pilkington, remember him, scored for Cardiff last night. And uh, Sheffield Wednesday are going to be at home to Reading in the next round after they both won against Carlisle and Stevenage. The fourth round lineup will be completed tonight. Um, there'll be a bunch of uh, replays. And in rugby, we expect Joe Schmidt to name his squad for the Six Nations today. A lot of um, intrigue about whether or not Jordan Larmer will be in. It looks like he will be, certainly judging from the uh, journalists who tend to know these things in advance. Uh, it was expected that he will be. No mention of um, Tyg Byrne, though, so it looks like he won't be. I mean, yeah. that doesn't really make that much sense to me at this point. You may as well get him in the system early, even if it's just to come in and train and go, <coughs> this is what you can expect next year, uh, if they think he's going to be a, an Ireland player down the line. Um, but and then obviously Simon Zebo, he said he wants to be in the squad. Bernard Driscoll said he'd have him in his team, starting at fullback at this point. Do we want to win in Six Nations? Do we want to put Jordan Larmer in? I mean, there's obviously uh, it's a double-edged sword. For sure. It, what's it going to be around 35 names today, I suppose? It's not like, and then like Larmer's going to be in the 23, I suspect. The, the, there's been such a clamour for him to be in there, so he's obviously going to be named in this squad today. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree on the burn point. He should be in this extended squad, maybe not in the 23, just to acclimatise him to things. I'm pretty sure it was this squad last year. Well, he, I don't think he was named in the squad, but certainly he had Tyler Blendal in and around the camp uh, early in 2017 just to see how Carton House operates because he would become uh, an Irish citizen this time now, essentially, yeah. but it, obviously he's unfit. Like, the same situation applies to Tyke Byrne, why not bring him in in and around the camp? He might not be named in the squad. I suppose living abroad maybe doesn't exactly help him. Yeah, I mean, it's only Wales. It's true. It's, <laughs> like, it's, it's not it's like... That's like an hour flight. It's not like he's got to get a connection via Dubai or anything to get no. back here. But it, it's, it's true. Maybe he won't be named in the squad. Maybe he could be introduced to Carton House, which I think would be a very shrewd move. The other big story today is that Conor Stakelin makes a bit of uh, Irish figure skating history he's on the ice in the European sh figure skating championships in Moscow just before 9 o'clock this morning uh, of course uh, a, a member of the famous Stakelum hurling dynasty um, and uh, best of luck to him and congratulations on getting this far and he's got hopes of qualifying for the Winter Olympics in four years time so uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on that we're bringing news across the day on the various radio stations on Today FM on Newstalk and uh, Spin and 98 FM We'll have a look at the back pages this morning and uh seems to be more of a, a different sort of variety to stories anyway this morning. There's been certain stories that have dominated for the last week or so. I think we're going to start uh, with some of the grobbler stories anyway, and we'll start with the Irish Examiner. There he is on the front of the sports section, short-sighted and unnecessary. Donald Lenehan on Munster's grobbler gaff. You've also got Mikey Sheehy up there and Martin O'Neill uh, on the base of that two big stories as well this morning. Uh, in the Irish Times, you mentioned... Uh, Gordon Darcy's piece today on Gerbank Grobler. Uh, Silence from top won't make doping issue go away, he says. Irish rugby has its doping problem now, and they imported it. Whoever decided that was a wise move needs their head examined if they knew. So that's the Irish Times. And then the other Gerbank Grobler lead is in the Irish Daily Mail. He's forgiven, reads the headline. Liam Higney's uh, subheadline says, Player stand with Grobler, says O'Mahony, which is... <sighs> 
It's an interesting one that, like, essentially Munster are in the trenches and they've sent out the players to deal with this thing in the I, media. I think, I think I'm just shocked that they didn't issue any statements as a hierarchy in advance of this, that they effectively left the players swinging in the wind. Like, they've put out their most experienced players. This is mm. like uh, Lions, veterans, Ireland caps, a go-go between them, and um, employees of the club. So... They can't come out and criticise the IRFU and they can't com come out and criticise Monster Rugby. And also it's a teammate. Like, you know, you can see that their job is to go out and tow the party line and they did it brilliantly. Like, uh, you know, endless respect for Conor Murray and Peter Manny, absolute legends of the Irish game and stand-up guys. But they have no choice but to go out there and say what they said yesterday. It is the leadership at Munster and the leadership at the IRFU who are the executives who make these decisions, who actually influence the decisions to select these players, to select Grobler, to hire Grobler, to pay Grobler, to bring him into your system. And uh, I just thought it was ridiculous from, um, from everybody involved to send the players out and go, you guys get out there and kill that message. And to the coach who inherited this mess, like... I, I just, it didn't make any sense to me, so. I presume being chief executive of Munster on a Tuesday afternoon is, is a terribly busy job, so I presume the schedule is just completely full up and they, they had to send the players out Last there. Last week was the time to, to come out and issue statements. We've asked them a bunch of questions. We'll, we'll bring you those questions a little bit later on, but just those pieces. So, like, it's Donald Lennon, again, an absolute uh, legend of Munster and Irish rugby in the Examiner, which is read by every Munster rugby fan who is openly criticising what Munster have done. Mm. He takes on all the points that the Munster fans, who some of the Munster fans who've got in touch with us, going, "Why isn't this a bigger deal in the past? And this has nothing to do with anybody. And he's made his mistake and get over it." Don't let him points out. He has a brilliant end to his article where he's talking about the physical building at the center of excellence where you come in and on the ground floor it's like the, the kids who are just making it and then you move up through the floors as you move up through the ranks until you get to rub shoulders with Peter O'Mahony, with uh, CJ Stander and with Conor Murray and that's when you've, you've made it to the top floor when you've got a full contract. So literally you have to physically make your way up through that building. It's a, it's a journey that the academy and sub-academy players go on and eventually they make it. But already parachuted into that top floor is somebody who took a shortcut, who cheated, who took drugs. And all the, sto the, the most recent studies um, show that you get a, a, a longer term benefit from taking steroids than just that immediate kick. So is it possible that Gerbrandt Grobler is still reaping the benefits of the uh, anti-cancer drugs that he took in uh, whatever year it was? Yeah, absolutely it is possible. We don't know that he, that he isn't still benefiting from them. And so if you're a sub-academy player, he, he talks specifically about the, the next John Hayes who is still a back rower who hasn't been converted into a prop yet, or the scrawny 19, 20 year old who doesn't actually become a proper second row until he's 24 or 25, looking at this going, what? This guy took drugs and he's ahead of me mm. in our system. The Murray point that he put forward yesterday was that uh, they were going to actually learn from Gerbank Robler in the academy, that uh, those people in the academy will be rubbing shoulders with Gerbank and hearing his horror stories of this awful time in his life where Do you know, maybe, the, the, maybe, drug dopers, the drug testers got him. Maybe, maybe Grobler is going to turn out to be one of the uh, most important people in the future of anti-doping because he comes clean and says, I got these drugs for this price at this time from these people and this is how I administered them to myself and I did it on the following occasions and there's a diary there and he blows the lid on the dope culture in South African rugby. Maybe that's what's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. And there's no evidence that that's going to be the case. So all the evidence that we have is he has a sob story about an injury. I mean, that he wasn't going to make it apart from this. And yet two years later, two years away from the game, he comes out and he's at one of the best teams in world rugby. Mm. So like he was clearly going to make it. The likelihood here is that uh, he's not going to come out and be that sort of leader for anti-doping because the majority of people aren't. The majority of dopers don't do that. Uh, we've got people who... Sir, to a certain extent, whistleblow, and that's good, I think. Like, we're going to get into Floyd Landis in a little while, and he's been one of the most important voices, despite the fact that he's been silent, essentially, for years, up until this interview with The Guardian yesterday. Uh, whether or not Grobler's going to be that guy, we don't know. We probably won't know until the end of his career. So we're talking 10 years here at this point, at least, until we... Oh, no, he's got to do it now, otherwise he's got no credit. Like, do you reckon so, yeah? Yeah, no, do it now. Come out. Let this be a teaching moment, and let the academy then go, right, so... I don't know. It's, hard, it's a hard sell for me that the academy somehow are going to benefit from having somebody like this in their midst. Like, you see, the thing is, I, I think it's Look just, at his muscles. Look at the size of him. I just think the, the, problem, the problem with doing it now, from my perspective, is that I, 
like it is the obvious thing to do from Munster's perspective. It, it is the, what they will say to Groveler. It's like, right, let's let's put you out there and you will be a beacon of hope for people who have got down this dark The hole. obvious thing to do is pay up his contract, say we made a mistake and move on. That's the obvious thing to do. I don't think that there's anything else that's like getting into this okay because he will have to say where he got the drugs otherwise it's pointless. Mm. You can't just go, oh, you know, some guy gave them to me or I bought them off the internet. It's like, that won't work. That doesn't wash. I'm sorry, if you're going to be an, an agent of change in anti-doping, having been a, a doper in the past, then it takes proper commitment. My point is that, do you think that there could be some faux PR around this? Oh, that, easily, yeah. And that's why but I think... The faux PR is like the drug-free sport or whatever those t-shirts Sure, and, and maybe the faux PR will actually lead to some good. And I, I just, uh, I don't know. bullshit, though. All faux si PR is bullshit. Since, since this has been done, I think if, if Gerbrand Grobler is put out as this beacon of hope, it's like this, 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 this like essentially he could, he could easily whistleblow and tell us exactly where he got the drugs and it could have no impact. Well, that's, sorry, that's not, that's not false. If he whistleblows and says, this is what I got, Maybe this not is what I experienced, then, then I'm 100% on board with him. Yeah. That's well, a completely different situation. But let's see him do that. We, sorry, we put a request in to Munster Rugby to speak to Gerber and Grobler and he is uh, getting consistent game time to recover from his long-term injury and so he won't be available over the next couple of weeks to do that interview. That was the story last week, when uh, late last week when we emailed. So, I mean, we can, we can refresh that request for an interview and see if he'll come on and speak to us about this because obviously we've got questions and he's got to answer those questions at some point. How do we know the answers will be truthful? We don't. We don't. Everybody has to make their own mind up when they watch it. That's my cynicism around this and the cleanup operation that could happen on a PR front. Well, I, uh, the cleanup operation has to has to come from the chief executive of the IRFU, the chief executive of Munster, and David Nusifora, because ultimately, somewhere along the way on that chain of command, somebody had decisions to go. Yeah, it's okay. We accept that you've um, you've taken drugs in the past, or we didn't know that he'd taken drugs, which is a, a case potentially suggested in Gordon Darcy's piece today, which would be mind-blowing, mm. because, you know, I'll just Google this guy, see what's coming up, uh-oh, oh, right, two-year ban for taking drugs? Okay, that's interesting, probably won't sign him. Yeah. Oh, no, we will. Yesterday seemed like the perfect opportunity for some of the top brass to come out and actually speak about this instead of just sending O'Mahony and Murray out there. And I, I, I think, you know, you've got a week into the story now and you've got voices like Donald Lennon talking about this. People are coming around to this view that it doesn't matter that, you know, he signed for the club months and months ago. It happened during the Lions tour. Sometimes things slip through the cracks. He hasn't played a competitive game. And there we go as well. That's the important thing. That, like, that is, that's the, the nub of the point here. But ultimately, it, it doesn't really matter. It, it, it's been it's been talked about now, and I see Lennon does mention the whole timing thing in his article today. He, he doesn't make an issue of it, but he does mention it again. I think it's completely irrelevant. All right, loads of comments coming through. We'll, we'll bring in the questions that we've asked specifically to the IRFU and to uh, Munster Rugby a little bit later on in the show. As ever, if you want to get in touch with us, leave a comment on uh, Periscope. That's uh, twitter.com forward slash off the ball, or you can follow us on uh, at off the ball AM, by the way, and uh, you get an opportunity there to turn on notifications. If you do that, anytime we go live on Twitter, um, it'll just pop up automatically for you, and uh, you, can, you can get involved. Uh, you can also get us on facebook.com forward slash off the ball. The other big story, obviously, last night is that the uh, Martin O'Neill contract situation is resolved. I mean, it is resolved. It is. It definitely is. Martin O'Neill did uh, a video interview with somebody from the FAI. And um, we'll play that in a couple of minutes' time. O'Neill claims to have agreed to terms with FAI, but deal is still not yet signed. I mean, I don't actually think the physical signing of the deal at this point is going to be that much um, of an issue, considering they've um, said it's all going to happen. O'Neill deal with Ireland resolved. That's the headline from the Times. Uh, Ireland and Larmer can make squad. Uh, so that's going to happen today. Um, ooh, Damien Comer was asked about hurling and whether or not he might um, be in... Tempted to switch to the hurlers. I didn't realise uh, he was good enough to play for the Galway hurlers as well. And then O'Neill says future with the FAI is resolved. It's, I mean, it's relatively straightforward at this point in that he's done that interview. Mm -hmm. He's broken in silence, shattered his silence in a dramatic fashion. We'll bring you that video in just a moment, but I just want to run through some of the other back pages because uh, Manchester United uh, across the sports sections again this morning on the back of the Irish Daily Star. Don't take the mickey, which I think is our tab of the morning to you this morning. Uh, it will get ugly if Henrik spoils deal. Reads a sub-headline there. Mino Raiola flaunting his, uh, his goods at the moment, which is his verbal his, strength. His mickey. But, um, but do take the mickey is the point. Um, they want to Arsenal to take the mickey. Well, R Raiola might be feeling to himself, don't take the mickey. 
and he's like the Mickey is staying in Manchester United. He doesn't if want he, to. If, if, if the Mickey's not getting a good enough deal, the Mickey will be staying in Manchester United as well. Oh, okay. He wants point. the Mickey in London. Yeah. Mourinho, agree, Mourinho agrees new deal, reads the back of the sun. Jose had a pen five year United contract, and he's also close to signing Alexis. Reads the end of that headline there. So Manchester United in the news again. Do they have a brand new Jose Mourinho and a brand new Alexis Sanchez to show for their January's efforts? Uh, okay, so the final few stories from you this morning. You're a disgrace. Fuming Wenger told Ref he was dishonest over a penalty decision. One of these days I'll take out the inserts so that they don't actually fall down and distract everybody. But yeah, you're a disgrace. Fuming Wenger told Ref he was dishonest over a penalty decision. This is um, Mike Dean. Not, not many people seem to like Mike Dean around football. No, there's some amazing quotes from that which we'll also get into in a moment. He's not it, a popular it's, manager. It's one of my favourite conversations. Uh, Harrington has Arduke primed for big comeback in Irish Gold Cup. Uh, Arduke had connections predicting a lordly performance at Leopardstown next month after the Irish Grand National winner headlined the entries for the Unibet's uh, Irish Gold Cup highlight of the inaugural Dublin Racing Festival. So, um, Dublin Racing Festival, I think the launch is um, was it yesterday or today, but certainly... It's an opportunity for uh, Irish racing just to kind of have another big uh, weekend. Uh, Canaries won't be caged. Bridge battle could be a close contest. This is Chelsea against Norwich. I'm not sure why the Racing Post are hyping up uh, Chelsea Norwich in the cup today, but I guess uh, and there's a back page and the um, you know sport has to go on it. Newspapers don't write themselves. Uh, Landis launches stinging attack after a failed drug test and says it will spell the end for Team Sky. Is the uh, back page story in the Guardian. Uh, Martha Kellner has spoken to Floyd Landis and then uh, Leicester Fleetwood, they've got that goal which was ultimately given by VAR last night, so that is the story there. So Martin O'Neill broke his silence last night in earth-shattering fashion. It was a dramatic interview with the FAI communications team. Let's have a look at that. Martin, can you give us an update on the contract situation? Yeah, that's been resolved. Uh, John and I have uh, agreed terms and it's just a matter now of the lawyers looking over some sort of detail and, uh, and getting it signed up. Exciting year ahead. Next week we've got the Nations League draw at the end of the year. Then we have the Euro 2020 qualifying draw. Exciting times ahead. Yeah, I think that uh, I mean the the um, the European Nations draw is an interesting one. It's coming up very very quickly, and obviously it's taking place now before the before the Euros in itself. So um, I I think that um, not everyone is absolutely au fait with the uh, the type of ruling about it anyway. But suffice to say that these games are pretty important. Is it the case now of focusing on the draw next week and looking ahead to the Euro 2020 qualifiers then? Yeah, um, I think first things first, obviously. I think that uh, the draw, that would be, be quite exciting for a start. And those games taking place then, obviously, at the, at the start of next season, as it were. We've got a couple of, um, of uh, friendly games coming up. And I think that might, be, that might just be the time to maybe introduce some uh, younger players who are are pretty hungry and uh, let's see how that goes certainly maybe even for the uh, for the first game in march um the comments underneath were wow a hostage video <laughs> the standard reaction to any interview at the moment is hostage video that kind of felt like one with quite nice artwork in the background uh, yeah, I, look, there was a very negative reaction to the video. There was just a negative reaction to everything that um, happens around the Ireland team and the FAI and O'Neill and John Delaney at the minute. And it's hard sometimes to separate the, is that a legitimate reaction from people um, or is it like, uh, because this is the situation. So they've got a, they've got a, a distance to travel with the Irish football fans where they convince everybody that this is the right decision for the relationship to continue. And it's hard because there's no meaningful games. I mean, for quite a long period of time, those friendlies, those new players. Maybe that's like maybe somebody does something in those new games, and it's quite exciting. Maybe um, the encouraging thing is that people are angry. Uh, people do care. It hasn't got to the point yet where people are like, "Oh, the Ireland national team." It's like we, we don't even care about this anymore. People do genuinely care. So as, as long as people care about it, there's always going to be hope. What I just find interesting about that video is that. That, that video could have been released last October and it would have been the same thing. It, it still talks about the agreement of a contract. They talked about the agreement of a contract in last October's video. Why not release a video when you've got some new information to bring us? Of course, the silence did have to be broken and I understand the, the reasons why a video was brought out. What I don't understand is that 
why it's still just the same old conversation about referring to this agreement of a contract without it being signed. Uh, a bunch of comments coming through. The Irish Six Nations could be scuppered in Paris in February. Away games also in Twickenham, um, uh, says Eamon. Um, grouped issue like Martin O'Neill's situation. Then Munster stick the head in the sand and hope this all blows over. Uh, great show, lads. Telling all the boys back home in Snewsbridge about it. Is that Newbridge? Is it Newbridge? Snewsbridge? Yeah, could be. Is he having a dig at us? Uh, is like, uh, no, we're not Snewsbridge. Okay. Fair. He's obviously like looking down on Newbridge from Nace or Kilcullen and going, Pfft, Newbridge. Are they superior to Newbridge? It's Shelbyville. Okay, fair enough. That's that's fair. But yeah, as, as uh, O'Neill was saying there, contract situation resolved, which is an important new detail. And uh, me and John have agreed terms, important new detail, aka new detail back in October. Uh, Floyd Landis, you mentioned him in the, on the back of the uh, Guardian today. You've been doing a bit of uh, journalism, I think they call it. Journalisming at its finest here. Basically, Floyd Landis, we, I think a lot of people who know Floyd Landis know what he's doing these days, which is essentially hiding away in Colorado, producing cannabis slash hemp based products. And, uh, totally legal, of course, we should say. Yeah, that's probably Colorado why Colorado was one of the Colorado. first most progressive states in, the, in America that actually legalized um, cannabis ages ago. Yeah, for sure. So he's got, uh, I can't actually remember the name of it. I'm sure if you bring up this, this image Floyds here. Floyds of Leedsville. F Floyds of Leedsville. Uh, this is a review of Floyds of Leedsville. Leedsville. Uh, and this is uh, a website that did a review, basically, of their produce, saying after spending weeks uh, reading just about everything I could find on the subject of CBD, a package uh, from Floyds of Leedsville just mi mysteriously shows up on this guy's desk, which is very much like the testosterone patches which showed up at, uh, at the cycling centre in the UK. If you look at the product there and you look at the colour scheme behind Floyd's of Leedsville and we have a look at this jersey, you will notice some very similar... Hey, similarities they're there. the same! It's amazing. It's like uh, getting his cycling past shoehorned right into his current product. Could have made it yellow, or just, just yellow. He could have done. So, um, would that, that have been a little bit too suspicious? The Live Strong brand is pretty, pretty uh, yellow, isn't it? That's true as well. Yeah. So, like, it, it, Lance has all his jerseys hanging up on his wall. Floyd just has these little tubs of hemp-based products that uh, essentially are just emblazoned with the World Championship rainbow jersey, and that's kind of his mark of continuing on. But, like, it was a very interesting interview with Marty Kellner in the Guardian, where he finally just slams Team Sky, and uh, Floyd Landis is exactly who we need to be chatting about this sort of stuff because he just laughs at the entire thing. Uh, I think the er, every single sentence is like, quote from Floyd Landis, he laughed. Uh, quote from Floyd Landis, he giggled. And it's just a complete <laughs> batch of sarcasm from him. You make it sound like he's stoned, but uh, that wasn't the case. Well, no, not, uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that he, he appreciates how ridiculous the whole Team Sky situation is. And the, my, my favourite line of it is, like he talks about the sympathy for Chris Froome and then Team Sky. He says it was just great PR about marginal gains and all these cute little sayings they thought up. It's just a fantastic line and pretty much sums up the entire discourse around Team Sky. But Landis, like kind of going back to Grobler a little bit, Landis has been such an important voice because he knows what the hell is going on. And particularly now, because he knows what was going on when cycling was at its worst. And yeah, he and, says and today is uh, not that much different. And he's an interesting test case because it wasn't straightforward, his bit from being a cheat to then being somebody who is actually going, okay, well, the system is, is wrecked and uh, here's how it got wrecked and has, has been very straightforward about how you end up doping. And I think that was um, one of the other points made in Gordon Darcy's piece today, which was brilliant, was that like, um, if you get to a point where everybody in the system thinks that somebody else is cheating, then they feel like they have to cheat. And so the excuse is, well, everybody's doing it. And it feels like that might be the case in South African rugby, because there are so many questions about the, the dope culture in South African rugby. And here we are injecting that into Irish rugby culture. And Darcy's piece is basically, you need to be very careful and vigilant about this, because if, if anybody in that academy or in Irish rugby thinks, well, he's doing it and he's getting the money, I have to do it to get the money. That's how this dog culture starts. And you can't get that back, like in cycling. Cycling's no, good. It's not coming back. The, the Landis situation, uh, it's written, it's kind of reminded me a little bit of the Michael Rasmussen interview we had on the show last week. Just kind of the, the whole idea of getting popped essentially when you're right at the top of the peak. Yeah. And it kind of makes you a little bit suspect of the powers that be in cycling that Lance could survive for so long. Well, we, we know from, th from, Tyler, from Tyler Hamilton's book uh, about Lance and his dealings with the UCI and all that. And he's very interesting on that. He, like Landis on Travis Tigar, for example, talking about him saying that he assured him 
him his objective was to figure out the anti-doping system and eliminate the guys running the sport, but that wasn't done. They were protected. Then on WADA, he says that they're designed to protect the Olympic Committee. They're not designed to catch people using PEDs, and here we are again, yeah. which uh, is an interesting view on WADA, and he's probably right, to be honest. Yeah. It, it is essentially the protection of the face of sport. If that means popping the most obvious dopers, then so be it. That's but if it. that means protecting the least obvious dopers, then so be it as well. Or, or just maintaining the system and the status quo so the dopers can continue unabated if they've got the right sponsors. Yeah, pretty much. Which is a grim thought. Um, two quick points. Uh, Eamon at, at Eamon 1236 on Grobler says, when Donald Lennon questions the Munster recruitment, it means you are in trouble. Munster, do the right thing, he says. And then Christopher Price says, the issue won't go away. Paul Kimmage will make sure of that. Like in politics, if you become the issue, it's time to go. And then somebody else wondering, why do people still care about international football? A very good question, but uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later on, perhaps, because we've got to move on to the GAA. Oshin Langan was down at Croke Park for us yesterday for the launch of the Allianz Football Leagues. We're going to hear from Damien Comer and Paddy McBrady of Galway and Donegal in a couple of minutes, as well as the Clare manager, Keen O'Neill, on their return to Division 1. But first, here's the Kerry selector, Mikey Sheehy. We're going to start with him talking about the very mouth-watering prospect of David Clifford in a Kerry jersey. Yeah, there's going to be, look, there's going to be absolutely enormous pressure on David. But I think he's, he's a very solid young fellow. You know, he's in training with us and uh, he's a very mature guy beyond his years, is what I'd say about him. And uh, obviously there will be, it's, it's a huge step, step up if he does go from minor straight into the senior. He's training on the squad and uh, he's, look, he's an exceptional talent. But again, the word I mentioned earlier on, patience. People will have to be patient with him because eventually it will happen for him, whether it will happen in the league, the championship this year or next year. But he's a serious, serious talent. I guess he needs a bit of protecting, but that's nearly impossible to do, isn't it? it it's very hard to shield him from the expectation, from the hype, from people saying to him, oh, you're going to be the next big star. So do you kind of nearly have to just sit back and let it happen naturally, or how do you handle it? Well, I think it's very difficult to handle, you know. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's only inside with us at training, and he's inside doing his gym sessions, and we only have him, you know, I don't know how many hours in a week. And, but he's, again, look, as I said, I think he's a very mature young lad. You know, we're only getting to know him ourselves, but look... I think Eamon Fitzmaurice has been very good at shielding players before and he will do his best and uh, I think Eamon is a very good mentor to have. There will be, and there's a, Morris Fitz will be very good with him as well, you know, be, being an ex-forward and, and I will do my best with him. But he's, he's a guy, the expectations are going to be huge, but I think he'll handle it and we'll handle it as well. Do you draw on your own experience being part of that great Kerry team and there was a lot of young stars in that? Uh, can you look back and take something from that regards, David? And if so, what? You can, but the only thing is, there's a, it's a huge difference now than from 40 years ago or however long ago we played. You know, there was no social media or any of that stuff, and that, that, that's where the pressure comes on. And you know, you know, you le you read a pile of crap. No, I'm not into it, but uh, guys would be telling me they're talking about this guy or they're talking about that guy, and that's where 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 pressure comes. But again, look, I'm sure look he'll make mistakes, and I'm sure we'll make mistakes with him. But I mean, it's going to be a, a, a learning process for him. But I have no doubt look, that he's going to star with Kerry, be it this year, next year, or whatever. He's just an exceptional talent. <laughs> Speaking of mistakes, uh, how much of your preparations for this year is informed by last year and that defeat against Mayo? Or can you look too much into to one game? Again, going back to what I heard David Moran say yesterday, he said generally, Kerry, if they have a lethargic quarter-final display, get better for the semi-final. And it didn't quite happen this year. Now, I know... In some ways, that's irrelevant given that there will be a Super 8 structure now, so it changes things, but how much do you take from that second game against Mayo? What do you think went wrong that maybe you can look at and fix for this year? I think, you know, you do try and learn, but I mean, you don't dwell too much on the past, you know, and, and uh, you, you try and take the positives out of it. Um, and to be fair to Mayo, um, maybe a lot of people should be giving Mayo credit for their performance in the replay. They were, they were far better than us, we have no issue with that. Um, we could have stolen it maybe in the drawing game, but I think Mayo deserve a lot of credit for it too. And like as it transpired in the Ireland final, they were only kicking up a ball again from beating Dublin. They were probably unlucky on the day. Yeah. But I think you know you, you try and pick a few positives. There weren't a whole lot, but I think overall the season last year, you know, we we won a Munster title again, we won the National League, we the Alliance League, and uh, we were disappointing against Mayo on the replay. But look, we learned from that, and, and we'd be hoping that we'll you know through hard work that we'll be there thereabouts again this year. Do you feel like you're far off the standard bearers, the Dubs? I think the Dubs have set a massive benchmark there. Look, they're an exceptional team. They're one of the best teams that have played the game. Uh, they're relentless. They're, you know, they e even when they're under pressure, you know, they, they they never panic. They don't do panic is the word, and you know, they're, they're going for four in a row, which is a absolutely unreal 
in, in present day football terms. And uh, but look, look, that's the beauty of sport. We'd be hoping that we might need to meet Dublin, but we'd be hoping that down the road that we will come across them at some stage and we'd love another crack at them. And finally, from me, because I know you're a busy man today, you're much in demand, uh, Mick O'Dwyer said in the documentary that was on TV last week that your goal against Dublin changed the course of history for Gaelic football in Kerry. How did you feel when you heard that? Yeah, I was, <laughs> it gave me a bit of a boost because I was getting a lot of slagging and text messages when I appeared missing the penalty across the Kerry five in a row. So, look, I don't know. Did it? I, I think what happened with that goal and John Egan's goal is that, like, I mean, Kerry had lost, we'd lost 76, 77. If we lost 78, Mikko probably would never have been heard of and neither maybe would a lot of us, you know. So it probably just cemented John Egan's goal. It was just before half time, and I think it was a platform to drive on and the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. That loss against Offaly famously has, has stayed with Mikko, it's never le- left him. Has it, has it stayed with you, you mentioned there, missing the penalty? Yeah, it has, absolutely. You know, when I retired from football, it was one of the first things when guys would say to, to me, ask me a question, you know, what were your memories of your career? And I would, that would be one of the first things I would remember. You know, it was a, a huge regret, just didn't score. Martin Fuller made a good save. Um, it, the save looks better, maybe it wasn't great, but it was a, I, I'll say it was a good save. And the one thing I'd say, like, that the fact that we, we lost the five in a row, I don't know what we have come back. Had we won the five in a row and won, won 84, 85, 86, to me, that was nearly as good achievement as winning the five in a row. And very finally, Donegal first up in the league this year in 2018. I almost said 2017. That's a tough start, isn't it? Tough start, um, Donegal, you know, Declan Bonner, new man in charge, and they've had a lot of good, very good minor under 21 teams, and they have a good balance, and he seems to be getting the balance right, and, you know, he, again, he probably will change the style of, of, of Donegal football, so it's a massive test for us, you know, we'll be missing some players, and I'm sure they will as well, you know, but I'm look, really, really looking forward to it. There you go, that's uh, absolute legend, Mikey Sheehy, talking... Uh, about the past and the present, and it's interesting that there is that line from Mikko through to the current squad, and um, I think it's important that that exists. That and he seems very tuned in with uh, that whole notion of you know those old players, and it's a different game nowadays. The game yeah. say the game. It, it really does, yeah. At the, when you mentioned the line through Mikko, that line used to be a lot more definite. I can remember uh, leaving Maynooth in 2009, the day Kerry hammered Dublin, and uh, we bumped into Mikey Sheehy, and uh, my dad like roared out the window to me. He was like, they haven't recovered since your goal back in the day. And he was like, I know they haven't, and they, hopefully they never will. Um, but unfortunately, they have. They very much have recovered <laughs> from that. And two years later, it was, it was to happen. But um, like, I, I, I do... It's easier cocky, aren't you? Well, it was it was after one of the most amazing victories that we've enjoyed because everybody was writing them off that day. But Pride before fall, I believe they say. That's what they say. But like, she he's an amazing addition to that backroom team. It's great to have him around there because I don't know. There's there's a lot of tactical now in and around the team, but there isn't anything sometimes like that. Just that guy who was part of the greatest Gaelic football team of all time, just to be there, just to chat. They're going to the Dublin like footballers in there now, do they? Oh yeah, good one, Jared. To to- top line humor right there, right off the top shelf. Um, she is uh, like as a, he's been a brilliant addition to that backroom team. To, I, I'm just happy to see that he realizes and the, the team realized what happened last year that there was some blunders. Let's just say they have 18 players missing. Apparently there were prices up on uh, various um, bookie sites yesterday. Donegal was big, big as 11 to 8 for that game in Killarney, but um, the prices have come down since it became well known that there are now 18 players missing. Yeah, from the G- Kerry team. Two of the players not missing, not on that list that was revealed by Fitzmaurice last night, are James Dunne and Paul Ganey. So you would still give them every chance in that in that game, but you can be sure that Kerry aren't going as gung ho for the league this year as they were last year. That was a monkey off their back to a certain extent last year, and I think after what happened in the summer last year, it's kind of like right, we do need to keep a lot in the tank for August. Yeah, but that July point, actually with the Super Eights. That point that um, was made during the week by David Moran that there's. A pre-season in the middle of the year so like this is your first season get everybody up to form try stuff out in the league unbelievably important to take a couple of weeks off do your next pre-season peak for a monster final slash the first round of the Super 8s but who cares though as long as you don't get relegated as long as you have those you tough just, games in Division 1 every year that's all that matters how do you, how do you stress test who's going to play where and when and the patterns of play I, I guess from inside the camp you do have to be treating them as big games but I think essentially when you've got 18 players missing you're going to have a lot of new blood in there just by necessity and it's up to them to prove themselves that gives them a carrot to make sure that they're in the championship squad 
Okay, so uh, next up, obviously, Kerry will face uh, Donegal in the first round of the Alliance Leagues. And uh, that game, as I said, is in Killarney. Paddy McBrearty uh, is also sat, sorry, right, sat down with Oshin to look ahead to the 2018 season. Here he is in the difference in uh, approaches and having a fresh voice this year in the form of Declan Bonner. Um, I suppose ideally we we, don't, we wouldn't like to lose our manager in Rory Gallagher, you know. But um, I suppose, including myself, there I was in from the start with Jim, and Rory was along with Jim, and then um, you know Rory took over from Jim. So that was seven years with Rory. So um, you know Declan has definitely brought a bit of freshness, whole new backroom team. So um, you know the, I suppose the younger lads are probably saying that about Declan. They've been th they've been with him this last six or seven years, but. Um, for the lads who haven't been involved with Declan there, who's, who've been there a long time, um, I suppose it's, it's a clean slate there, you know, being in with Declan. But, you know, he's as a current pl as a past player himself there, he's brought a lot of experience in there and uh, you knows his success as an underage manager definitely brings a lot of ref freshness into it too. So, you know, we're just looking forward to the league now and, uh, you know, giving us a good stepping stone going into the championship. And it's important, isn't it, that he doesn't have to come in completely cold, he doesn't have to win a lot of ye over because he has that loyalty from what he did with the minors. And from the older guys then, I guess it creates the competition of you're competing with these young guys. So it's a, it's a nice balance, isn't it? No, definitely. I suppose uh, a lot of the lads that have been there, they're, you know, um, over the last couple of years, they might, have been, might be starting to be questioned, you know, and the younger lads definitely coming in there and, and putting, putting, I suppose, the lads that have been there under a bit of pressure. So um, no, definitely, it definitely brings the intensity up in training. And, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely good for, for competition without the squad. And you're in that kind of weird mid place of being a young guy, but one of the more experienced players. So, is that a role that you kind of you 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 like? Do you do you talk in training? Do you give guys instruction? Do you see yourself as kind of a, a senior player at this stage? I'm uh, not really. No, I suppose it's, I don't. I, I wouldn't like to you know go too much into it. But um, no, it's just if, if, if just chatting with forwards mainly. You know, just chatting with inside lads you may be playing with is is what I try and stick to. You know, I don't like to be too vocal within the training sessions. Uh, to be honest with you, but. Um, you know, to any of the younger lads that are that are inside forwards or half forwards, definitely, I just try to give them, you know, a bit of knowledge and uh, you know a bit of experience, definitely. But um, I suppose it was the same with Michael and Colin when I came into the squad. They give, they give me a few talks as, as to what to do and on and off the pitch. So um, no, definitely, any any bit of advice you get as a young fella definitely is uh, is beneficial. Is it a strange place now, Donegal training, without some of those old familiar names and faces that have that have stepped away? I mean, they've not just brought experience; they brought a lot of skill away with them. I know you have young lads, I know you have good players, but, but these guys we've missed by any team. Yeah, definitely. I suppose um, it's been well documented. We lost a lot of lads there. I think if you compare the two teams from from 2012, 14 to, to now, definitely it's a completely different new team, to be honest. But um, no, listen, uh, a lot of them younger lads, they've done well underage and they've, they've the right frame of mind, to be honest with you. They're, they're all good lads there. They're, they're one little bit... Uh, bit in the hard yard of training and, uh, you know, it might be this year or next year, but definitely... Um, then young lads are definitely going to come to come to blossom, you know, and uh, you know hopefully there's a big future ahead of them in Donegal. Have they brought in a kind of a, a shot of energy and freshness that perhaps maybe was <coughs> needed because there was a lot of guys there with a lot of football under the belt. They played, you know, they trained at an intense level for many years, and maybe it just needed a bit of freshening up between the management and new players coming in. No, definitely. I suppose they they, they want to make their own kind of bit of history. I suppose they watched Donegal win all Ireland there um, a couple of years ago, and I suppose they wanted to create their own bit of history. They want to be competing for Ulster titles. So, you know, hopefully they, they push on now and uh, keep that going, you know, and try and try and make their own kind of bit of history. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if McBrady shoots the lights out in Killarney, you can see that game's going to be a good game. Probably will be, yeah. It's going to be entertaining. It's actually a nice weekend, opening weekend. You've got Cork and Kenny the night before as well. So it's, it's a good opening it's weekend. Sunday like, afternoon, is it? Uh, yeah, Kerry Donegal is Sunday afternoon in Clarny, yeah. It's like McBrearty, I, I, he's obviously an amazingly talented player, but I just wonder with every passing year that Donegal aren't in the conversation for an All-Ireland, Jim's legacy just kind of grows and grows, doesn't it? I mean, like obviously a, a player like McBrearty was involved, but he gets better with every year. And then you're thinking if the young players are getting better every year, the, the, the drop-off in talent from the Jim era actually isn't that much. And you just think that there was just this amazing like culture created in those couple of years that he was around and I don't know maybe the talent isn't anywhere near how it was during the Jimmy era I just don't think it's as as much lower as some people think I think that it has been uh, it has been significantly lower um, in recent seasons and maybe some of those young lads are getting to that level but like you're talking about the absolute peak years of a bunch of players some of whom were like you know 
um, Carl Lacey was in the conversation for Footballer of the Year, and deservedly so, and was a beautifully balanced, perfect he won footballer, footballer in that system. So Exactly. Fair point. <laughs> Not just in the conversation, he won it. Um, and I don't think they have anybody at that level at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's a fair point. I, I guess I'm taking McBeerty as a microcosm, and maybe there isn't anybody else on McBeerty's level. But I, he, he hasn't reached his potential yet either. Like, there's that game against Cork two years ago was the one where people were like, holy crap, this guy's amazing. And uh, we haven't seen a performance other than that since. If you had one other forward, just to kind of split, split the load a little bit more, you might see yeah. Nick McBeerty again. Another, another Michael Murphy wouldn't go miss either. No. Uh, right, Kildare manager Keane O'Neill uh, up next. They're facing Dublin under lights in Croker on Saturday week. How far can Kildare go this year? Here's O'Neill on the importance of being back in Division 1. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think last year's league campaign was very important for us for the simple reason that um, you know we had just been in Division Three the year before, um, and that, that was tough, that was a tough division to get out of. You know, every match was was really a slog, um, but we persevered. And you know, a lot of people would have thought that even retaining Division Two status, you know, would have been progress for the team. And to be fair to that group of men, and match by match, you know, they really, you know, worked so hard in training and on the pitch, and they got the they got the rewards. Unfortunately, the league final didn't go the way it. Um, you know, we wanted it too, but in the back of our mind was Division One status for the 2018 season. And if you look back at all the successful teams in terms of winning provincials, but particularly all Ireland's, you know, the vast majority, you know, particularly all Ireland's, are from Division One. So it's where you need to be. If we're judging Kildare off where, as a county, you want to be, I guess we have to look at that game against Dublin in the Championship. If you had had a season of Division One football, do you think that slow start might have happened? Do you think your intensity would have been up because? For large parts of that game, you competed with Dublin, which is not something that every team can say that they did, but just those few minutes that you let them get away, that was the difference. Do you think some, something like that would be more unlikely to happen had you had a season in Division 1? Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. Um, to be fair, in the Dublin match, it wasn't actually that we started slow. We actually started quite well in terms of our intensity um, and putting Dublin under pressure. We just didn't execute. Um, but I think what really cost us, and I think that's what Division 1 is all about, is we didn't concentrate for 70-plus minutes. You know, if you look back at the two goals that we conceded in such a short period of time, um, I mean, there were goals that we wouldn't have conceded in Division 2. Um, I mean, we were very frugal. We only conceded three goals across the, the eight games, including the league final. Our defence was really watertight. Um, but when you're playing against the top teams, they know how to punish you and they can do it very ruthlessly, no more than Kilkenny did when you know they had their great run uh, in the late noughties there. So we just dropped our concentration levels um, and that was a pity because it hurt us badly. There were still patches where you know we, we raised our levels again and, and we challenged Dublin to be fair. But ultimately, let's be honest, after 70 plus minutes, there was nine points between the teams and that to me is all the evidence you need. We were nine points inferior to Dublin on that day. Hopefully we can close the gap this year and um, Division 1 is a great kind of state of preparation, playing the best teams week in, week out to do that. Is it ideal so to have them first here in Crow Park in the Allianz League? Um, I think you need to be careful what you wish for. Um, I, I think it's great to be playing the Dublins, the Kerrys, the Tyrones, the Donegals, so on and so forth. I think it is. And, you know, to be fair, playing a team like Dublin, who, who are the top team in the country and have been for the last number of years, I think it'll give you a, a fairly solid barometer of where you are after your pre-season. I mean, Dublin haven't put in the pre-season. We have, obviously, they've had their, their team holiday well-deserved. Um, but they still have an incredible squad of players. They're very well managed and organised, you know. So it'll be a real test for us. So I, I like to see it as a barometer that'll gauge where we are going into match two, three, right up to match seven, you know. What do you need this year that you didn't have last year? I suppose every team wants scoring forwards, every team wants to score more, but has that been an issue? Is that something that you're looking to solve particularly? Well, we kicked 117 against Dublin in that Leinster final, you know, more than more than anyone else did um, last year in championship. So I think what we need is consistency across the field in terms of our play, um, you know, from kickouts, restarts, from set pieces, um, defensively be more consistent. You know, as I said, we were very consistent in the league, um, to be fair. But then there was a couple of lapses in championship, which isn't surprising because championship is at a higher level than the league. So you do get punished. Um, and then underperformed against our mass. So it, it has been an issue with Kildare for many, many years now is consistency across a campaign. There'll be, you know, great one-off performances or maybe one or two back-to-back, -back, but trying to maintain that level, which is what the top teams do. Um, or even if you look at what Mayo have done the last couple of years, they've started slow, but they've grown into every match and improved as it went on. I think that's something that we need to kind of instill in our group of players that 
last week is last week and we need to focus on you know the performance levels this week as opposed to maybe living on a previous performance if that makes sense yeah as a Kildare fan I like Keane O'Neill and um, the one thing that I was concerned about with the papers today he was saying that there's just a lifespan on, on being an inter-county manager he doesn't want to get paid for it it's a great hobby to have but ultimately I think somebody needs to come into Kildare and be the manager for a five year period and establish early on we're going to be a Division 1 team and everything will come from us being a Division 1 team and if we have a couple of years where we don't get great results in the championship but we establish ourselves as everybody coming into the setup understands that we're a Division 1 team um, then I'd be happy enough with that because ultimately that will lead to longer term sustainability in the championship as opposed to in the past sometimes we've had these good years in the championship and then the team drifts out and the new squad members get used to Division 2 football mm. and when the championship happens they're like oh you guys are a bit better than what I'm used to. Yeah for sure because establishing yourself as a Division 1 team would then mean you're the second best team in Leinster for a start and I think that's a huge plus because I, I think the ceiling for, Lens for Kildare is to get to a level like somewhere where Monaghan are and you think with Monaghan you think of those two huge hammerings they've taken against Dublin in the last three or four years in championship at least Kildare will get that gauge every year if they're the second best team in Leinster they will get of course you're going to get hammered by Dublin now <laughs> oh, sure, this is grim but that's terrible at least you will have the gauge of whether or not they're, the thing is narrowing every single year their target has to be, to be as good as Mayo like it has to be they just don't have the players yet but like there has to be a bunch of 15 to 20 year olds who they can invest in over the next five years and turn into a team who are as athletic as um, well prepared uh, you know just but move the entire Jack O'Connor clan up to all his relatives move them all up to Moorfield yeah maybe I mean who knows who knows like I, I think as I said I don't, I, I'd like Keanu Neal to stay for another couple of years I think that um, he's brought the, the right approach and I just think that it's also good to have somebody from inside the county yeah it's true the, the old outside influences they're, they're animals those outside influences aren't they yeah yeah so listen um, we will bring you the Michael Comer interview we'll put that up on uh, Facebook for you sorry Damien Comer uh, uh, Damien Comer we'll put that up for you a little bit um, later on uh, on Facebook and on YouTube as well sometimes we put longer interviews up on YouTube so it's worth checking out and subscribing to our youtube.com forward slash off the ball account as well um, for more good quality sports content across the day wherever you are now just to go back to the Garbrandt Grobler story because obviously it continues to roll on. It's a full week of significant questions being raised about how Munster and, by extension, Irish rugby have found themselves in the situation they find themselves in at the moment. Really interesting columns this morning from Donald Lenehan and Gordon Darcy. Uh, Gordon Darcy, obviously, an absolute legend of the game from a Leinster and Ireland perspective, and Donald Lenehan is one of the most qualified people in Irish rugby to comment on this. He makes the case that this is an issue entirely of Munster's own making and that they need to be unbelievably careful about the message they're sending out to the academy players within the Munster Centre of Excellence. A brilliant piece in The Examiner which really evocatively points out the journey that Munster players go on before they actually become the elite players and the implication is that you can take a shortcut and reach the top floor of Munster Rugby literally and metaphorically so that's a brilliant piece uh, that you should read today and then also some of the stuff that Gordon Darcy the points that he makes about systemic doping I don't necessarily agree uh, that we can we we can believe that that's not an issue uh, I just don't think that we can be complacent about that stuff but the rest of the stuff is absolutely bang on the money and it's really interesting to see somebody from within the rugby bubble who has just come out of it going actually you know what this is this is really really dangerous for the message that it sends out so after a week what are the questions that remain to be answered by Munster and by the IRFU these are the specific questions that we want Munster to answer have a look at this Philip Brown in the IRFU's anti-doping report in 2015-2016 very clearly the very first line of the report says Irish rugby has a zero tolerance towards cheating in rugby. That is now not the case. When did Munster's zero tolerance on drugs policy end? How does having a confessed drugs cheat on your team tally with a zero tolerance policy? Who in the IRFU had the final sign off on the decision to offer Gerbrand Grobler a contract and was due diligence done on Grobler's drug taking? Was the decision to offer him a contract made in the full knowledge that he had used an anabolic steroid? What is the message to the Munster, to the Munster Academy players about drug use when there is somebody who used drugs in the first team squad and do you accept that there are mixed messages there? And finally, the standing of Munster in world rugby is something that has to be protected. Absolutely has to be protected. Do you accept that that standing has been damaged and that the credibility on the issue of anti-doping is damaged as a result of what's happened this week? Questions, similar questions for the IRFU. Again, the IRFU is a zero tolerance policy to cheating within rugby. When did that zero tolerance policy end and why? How does signing a convicted drugs cheat tally with the zero tolerance policy? 
Who in the IRFU had the final sign off on the decision to offer a grobbler a contract? Did that person do due diligence? And if they did, how did they come to the decision to sign him? And specifically, does David Nusifora run these decisions past the CEO or the board of the IRFU? And then was the decision to offer him a contract made in the full knowledge that Grobler had used an anabolic steroid? There's a couple more questions that we need to ask the IRFU. The science shows and continues to show that the benefits from drug use can last years, which would implicate or at least suggest that there's a possibility that Gerhard uh, Gerbrandt Grobler could still be reaping the benefits of his cheating. Do you accept that science? And if you do, why are you having somebody who has the potential to be benefiting from a, a positive drugs test in 2015 playing for us in 2018? Why not just pay up the contract and remove the possibility of him ever representing Irish rugby in a competitive game? Do the IRFU accept that this decision has damaged the anti-doping credentials of the organisation? When they claim to have a zero tolerance policy, you have somebody who has cheated on your books, in your employ and representing you. And finally again, for the IRFU, what message does this send to the academy players in the Irish system when a doper is hired for a significant role in the Irish system? These are the questions that should have been answered last week. These are not questions for employees of the organisation who are players whose job it is to go out and win games. This is for the executive branch of Munster and it's for the executive branch of the IRFU to answer at this point. This is not an issue for Conor Murray or Peter O'Mahony or even for Johan van Graan, the Munster head coach. They are employees, they are doing their jobs and they're looking at, at, at an asset that they have and a teammate that they have and they go, okay, this is our team spirit and this is our team unity and what do we do here? Uh, so they're in an unbelievably difficult situation, not of their making. This is a situation of the making of the IRFU and Munster Rugby and Gerbrandt Grobler. He has to accept responsibility for his part in this as well. So the whole notion that, oh, you know, you've got to be sorry for this guy because he didn't know this was going to be a storm. Well, tough. You took the drugs, you, uh, you got caught and you have not told us why you took those drugs. You've got a, a concocted story about no, not uh, necessarily thinking you're going to make it, but here you are two years down the line, not having played rugby for two years, and suddenly you're able to uh, get a place in one of the best teams in world rugby. Um, who gave you the drugs? How much did they cost? How did you administer them? Who else do you think was actually taking drugs? How many of your teammates? What level of conversation was there about that? Blow the whistle on that, Garbrandt, and maybe we can get on board with you. But for now, they're the outstanding questions. Absolutely. I think we're going to change tack a little bit to basketball uh, for the time being uh, on the back of that. We're going to, well, yesterday actually, I was just chatting to uh, Pat Burke, the former Ireland player. He's played at a top level professionally here in Europe. He's played at a top level uh, in the NBA as well, playing for the Orlando Magic and the Phoenix Suns. It's a very interesting career. We chatted for a long time. We're going to play uh, a segment of it here. We're chatting, first of all, here about his first foray with an NBA team, which was the Orlando Magic. He was playing under Doc Rivers. He was signed by Doc Rivers at the time. And uh, I started by asking him here just about the environment of being a centre in the NBA at that time, of course, a time when the likes of Yao Ming and Shaquille O'Neal were both at the peak of their powers. Yeah, uh, it was exciting. I, I, you know, the, when I came in uh, to the Orlando uh, practice centre, you know, just, just getting into the locker room first and actually putting on the gear... Um, was exciting, you know. There's, there's a almost that unreal moment. Like, is this really happening? And then I, I can remember opening up the practice door and walking into their training center and seeing the likes of Tracy McGrady and Grant Hill and Mike Miller, uh, Sean Kemp, and it was like, wow, I'm really here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they were playing. They're playing. It was preseason, so they're playing a lot of pickup ball. And uh, the great thing was, is I was holding my own, and a lot of the guys were coming up to me, Grant Hill, like, w where are you from? You know, and it was almost like, you know, the Pat Burke went to Auburn University, you know, obviously a school that was more, it's more known for football and less for basketball, never really existed, you know, because no one ever heard of me. I wasn't drafted. So the uh, season itself and getting time in the beginning and playing the likes of Yao, Shaq, and all that, it was, uh, it was a tough you know, I, I mean, I never looked at myself playing basketball as being undersized. I always thought I was a very big person. But you know, Yao Ming, the 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 first the first NBA experience he had was when the Magic went to Houston to play him. The whole place is dressed up uh, with dragon uh, decorations, and they had uh, Chinese beer serving that night and the whole time, every time he touched the ball, everybody was singing Yao Ming, Yao Ming, Yao Ming, Yao Ming. But the likes of him at 7'6", I mean, just, you know, it's, 
it's unreal to play a person that big. Sure. You know, and then going into the to the Lakers and the Staples Center and starting those games, and then you know, jump ball goes up, and you're you know, you're going down one time on offense, and you know, the ball comes around, and Tracy takes a shot, and you're, but you don't even know the likes and the strength of a, of a man like Shaquille O'Neal till you're back on defense, and I'm running back as fast as I can, and the advice that I've been given from our coaches is one. When Shaq goes up the dunk, get out of his way. <laughs> and number two was when you go back on defense, you need to do your work early. So it's almost like there's an airplane and it's landing. And at the beginning of the landing strip, that's where you're going to want to slow it down. Mm-hmm. And you're going to try and hold on to it and, 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 and face it. And you're going to put your feet down on the ground. And you're going to try and you know, use your brakes. And that's, that's where I would I'd meet him at the free throw line. And Shaq would, you know, he'd come down the lane and he'd, I'm sorry, he'd come down at half court. And by the time he made it to the three-point line, you know, his 7-2 frame would then throw up his arms, almost in the way of showing to the referees, I want you to watch this guy who's guarding me. I'm not going to do anything abnormal. I'm not going to throw him or I'm not going to throw any elbows. I'm just going to walk down. And he'd had his arms straight up and he would just come down. And, and I was probably... Uh, close to his belly button, you know, putting my forearm up into him, trying to slow him down. And it was, it was like, you know, meeting a semi truck. Yeah, and can... then when he got the ball, I just, you know, obviously you've seen that you've seen Shaquille O'Neal enough to know that the likes of a six ten guy are not going to stop the seven two guy who's over three hundred pounds. And so I, I remember, you know, just those, that type of player. That, that was amazing. I mean, yeah. so today's, like you mentioned too, is today's NBA. There's more of a hybrid athlete. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of being able to do everything, and I think it's a lot of guys with a smaller frame because they need to have speed. Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of that, uh, that first season at Orlando Magic, it's a very interesting one because of T-Mac. It's one of the greatest seasons a wing player has ever put in in the NBA. He wins his first scoring title that year as well. And I know you've spoken about it in the past, uh, this kind of selfish nature that sometimes prevails in the NBA as opposed to the team culture that you see in Europe. And I'm wondering about McGrady that year. Is he looking at his stats line every single night, looking at trying to keep his averages up? Uh, no, I but no, I don't. I don't think it's it's like that. I, I don't think that you know he's looking to create a, a score a scoring uh, average or looking at the stats. It's the NBA obviously is set up for entertainment, and what they have to do is they've got to they've got to find the greatest scorers. And if you've got one or two or three of them on your team, then you're you're a contender. So the likes of Tracy, when when Grant Hill went down that year, Tracy had to take the, the full load. And, uh, you know, he had to almost put Mike Miller under his wing as well. And so, you know, I think the experience of that year was was not so much based on um, selfishness, but understanding that this guy is, is, you know, the highest paid player on the team. And the whole organization is looking at him to, to make us win. And to do so, he's going to, sh- he's going to shoot the ball, you know, pretty much any time and every time that he can coming down, uh, and so, in, in doing that, it's, it's hard to it's hard to play alongside that as well and produce because he's taking so many shots that you may not touch the ball too many times. You may not get enough shots in the in the first quarter or the first half to warm up to to have any type of stats. So, um, it was an experience too because you know when he's taking that many shots and in, in the in the God given talent and athleticism that he had, it was all lining up for a spectacular year. I, I, you know, I, I've been blessed to see a lot of great um, athletes and, and be on the same team as them. But yeah. you know, that year was uh, extremely special. Absolutely. In terms of them, we might fast forward onto the Phoenix Suns, and you, mes- you mentioned special players, and Steve Nash obviously is the guy who comes to mind from that particular uh, Phoenix team. You've also got Amari Stoudemire. You've got Sean Marion on that team. It's a star-studded outfit. But what I'm interested in is the Mike D'Antoni influence on that team, the, the running and gunning style, the seven seconds or less. Uh, ex- explain to us what that is, and I'd imagine how difficult that can be to be a centre in a running and gunning style team. Uh, it's not too hard for a centre because uh, Mike didn't really play a centre. Okay. <laughs> he had uh, two power forwards. Uh, you, know, I, you know, Kurt Thomas got some minutes uh, Brian Grant, myself, 
uh, even Sean Marks from there. You know, it was it's that age of, of what you were talking about before. It's almost like the end of the dinosaurs. Mm. You know, anybody who's you know has the inability to make it up and down the floor. And, and Mike uh, even said this at the beginning of the season. He said, "Look." You can take a break running up and down the court, but I promise you this, if you do, you're never going to touch the ball and score. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, you're getting it from day one with an understanding that this team's strategy is built on speed. Sure. So the idea of seven seconds or less is, you know, the other team is looking to, you know, to work the ball around if they're going to use whatever. They're going to use the triangle offense or they're using zipper screens and all types of X's and O's. You know, you're, you're, you're not looking to obviously get into foul trouble, but you're making the work a little bit. And, and within the other team scoring and us inbounding the ball, I mean, you've got one of the, the greatest passers and point guards um, of basketball where, you know, Steve was very good with court vision. So, you know, as soon as the inbound would come in from Boris Diaw, you know, I would say that, you know, many of the plays, Steve could dribble the ball in less than two dribbles and already have the ball in the hand of Amari or Sean Marion dunking the ball on the other end. And right, what occurs yeah. is for the first three quarters, most of the teams think they're actually playing with us, that, you know, we're, uh, we're, we can handle it. What they don't realize is our guys, we only had a seven-man rotation, and they were conditioned to play fast. And so for the fourth quarter, usually the beginning of it, that's when you would see the separation of um, scoreboard. And that's where, you know, you see our opponents usually would, you know, be down, to, down 10, down 15, and they could, never, they could never catch back up because we were playing the same speed the whole time. They're playing a speed that they're visiting that night against us. They're not used to that. And so if we could get them going as fast as we were, we knew that at the very end, you know, Shaquille O'Neal would never be able to keep up. Yao Ming, I mean, we, they, we used to have it on video that Yao Ming would barely be able to make it from his defensive basket at the free throw line to the to the half court before he'd have to keep turning back and forth because we were moving the ball so fast. So he would never, he'd barely make it down on offense, and he'd very, very, very rarely be able to get back on defense before we'd already score the basket. Yeah. It's it's an interesting one, and I guess the D'Antoni revolution then at Houston Rockets is exactly what you're talking about there. That if it's the end of the dinosaurs back then during your time to Phoenix Suns, then the dinosaurs are well and truly extinct at this point. And uh, I guess if you were in the NBA today, if you can't shoot the three, particularly under Mike D'Antoni and Daryl Morey, as they call Morey Ball at the Rockets, then you're doomed really if you can't shoot the three. But I'm interested more so even from about your end of days at the Phoenix Suns because I understand Steve Kerr comes in as general manager towards your last couple of months there. Is it a voluntary thing when you leave the Suns? Is Steve Kerr involved with that process at all? <laughs> this is a great question. Uh, no, you know, the, the seven seconds or less uh, strategy uh, also had that, that Mike was playing a seven-man rotation. Okay. And the seven-man rotation, my second year, started to become um, a little split in the locker room where, you know, on a 14-man on a roster, the other seven were, were like orphans. There was no communication going on. Mike um, very rarely spoke to anybody who wasn't in the rotation. Uh, even uh, Robert Sarver, the, the majority owner of the Suns, he would come in and He'd go up to Leandro Barbosa and say hello and how are you doing, and I'd have the locker right next to him, and then he would make a big horseshoe around me in his path, and he'd go over to Boris Diaw, and I would be like, "This is amazing!" Wow, you know, if 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 some of the guys are in here and we're all you know on a, on a unit and we're all looking to to help and assist, it was like the uh, the coaches and the front office um, didn't have. I don't know if it was the maturity or just the social graces to actually keep it all together because it was kind of, you know, we're going to play these seven. We don't have time to talk to anybody else, and, and frankly, we don't really even care. Mm. So when we got to the end of that season, the seven seconds or less seven-man rotation in an 82-game season going into the playoffs, created a lot of opportunities where the seven guys who weren't playing started to realize, well, we're not getting in. So then in practices that were only about 47, 45 minutes long, a lot of the guys were not in shape. Um, you know, we weren't practicing. We weren't getting off the bench. So if you remember 
uh, when we were playing San Antonio at the end of uh, that year, Robert Ory hip checks uh, Steve Nash into the timetable. Boris Diaw and Amari uh, get up and they take a step over the uh, sideline. And they told us in the beginning of that year, in any altercation that occurs on the court, as soon as any player on the bench gets up and has their foot on the court, they're going to be in a, a one-game suspension. Right, okay. And uh, as soon as that occurred, I remember I was sitting there and I was looking, and I saw their feet, and, the, and I said, these guys are not going to be around for the next game back in Phoenix. Mm. And uh, so after the game was, was over, you know, and it was all over the sports networks that these guys weren't going to be there and who is, who is the son to look at. And uh, so some reporters came up to me and started asking me, you know, what have they said to you? You know, because you are the only active uh, big man for the, the Suns right now that's going to be able to play. And I said, they haven't said anything. Right. And they said, what do you mean they haven't said anything? I said, none of the, none of the coaches have talked to me about anything. And, I, and so then I, you know, I spilled the beans on it. And I said, you know, and in the last three, four months, they haven't been talking to us at all. Mm. Um, you know, and, they, and so one of the reporters asked me, um, you know, well, what are your thoughts? on Popovich's team and Mike D'Antoni's. And I shared with them, well, you know, Popovich has proven, you know, he's got world championships and he's done a great job and Mike is looking to get there. But I do know that in the seven-man rotation, we've got four people, we've got guys that are not ready and we also had guys that had nagging injuries. And so anyways, that was the, uh, that was probably the, the nail that hit the coffin because the next day my agent called me and he said, are you trying to get thrown off the team? <laughs> and uh, uh, so then the, when, when you were sharing the next season, you know, I, was, I was good friends with the, the guys, and, and I do believe that uh, you know, even with those comments you know, and not looking to, to burn the team, I've always thought that you know, I take a positive approach and I look to bridge uh, you know, a lot of players together. And Steve Nash uh, was really uh, an advocate of me being a part of the team. So he wanted to talk to Steve Kerr about bringing me back. Uh, I had a two-year deal with the team. So Steve put a good word in for me, and uh, he shared, you know, you should probably call Steve Kerr and just, uh, you know, let him know where your headspace is, you know, about the comment that you made and where you're at. So when I called Steve, I was here at my house. We had about a 35- to 45-minute conversation about that whole situation and what was going on. At the end of it, Steve uh, said, well, Pat, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. That's really great, um, but uh, we're going to move in a different direction. Yeah, uh, it was exciting. I, I, you know, the, I came in uh, to the Orlando uh, practice center. Wow. You know, just, just so far we had to play it twice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're going to move in a different direction. Yeah, Steve Kerr, ruthless in his GM role. It's not something we hear a lot about. We hear about the great coach, the great worldly man. Probably, to be honest with you, a ruthless GM is probably a great GM, to be honest. You do have to be with cap space and all yeah, that. Yeah, totally. That was pretty interesting. One of the Tullamore Burks. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably the most important part of his character. He said he was home for his brother's wedding years ago. Uh, doesn't come home very often. He's got quite young kids, living in Florida now. And uh, Pat Burke's Hoops is where you'll find him if you want to pop into him if you're in Florida anytime. Pat Burke's Hoops. Yeah. You just walk in and play a bit of hoop. If you're a kid, you can, yeah. I, I'm sure... Uh, I, I don't think you'd be allowed if you're an adult, basically. Uh, Didn't right. ask him that. Some uh, quick comments for you. Mead Birder on uh, the Grobler story says, you know it's been scientifically proven that the positive effects on performance from steroid and PED abuse can last years. This is a story from 2015 where they did um, uh, research, sorry, from 2013 rather, they did research on mice that said that if you give the mouse um, testosterone, then... Uh, after a period of time, take him off it, he can regain muscle really quickly. And the impact, uh, the, the implication being, you take steroids, you train your muscles to grow rapidly, you stop taking them, you can regain that muscle growth very quickly, much quicker than a normal human being who hasn't taken steroids again because the muscle has been trained. So actually the impact, that short course gives you an impact that lasts 
in this case, they were they were speculating that it could be a decade. So um, that's one of the reasons why maybe a two year ban is is absolute nonsense, and maybe that's one other aspect of this conversation that we just need to look at. It's like if you take anabolic steroids, even if you fess up to them, you get a two year ban. Why shouldn't it just be an automatic four year ban? Like what's it ha- there has to be some kind of deterrent. Yeah, for not sure. that it works anyway, but. Even if there's no tolerance doping policy, though, and you, and even if it's out of your system within a week and it doesn't do any long-term benefits whatsoever, if it's no tolerance policy, it's a no tolerance policy. The, the the actual act of it, obviously, is the most important thing. Carl Kruger wonders, what was the Razzie Rasmus role in signing Grobler? Nice for him to be away from the controversy and not be mentioned at all with this story. Well, we did mention that, obviously, Razzie Rasmus would have had a role in this as the uh, director of rugby. He is the person who handled the contract negotiations with uh, various agents who I've spoken to over the last while, and so he would definitely have been involved. But because uh, Grobler is an overseas player, that would have to have been ratified by the IRFU as well. And no doubt, at some point, a conversation is had where the organisation decides we are collectively okay with bringing this drug sheet in. And if it wasn't, then what does that say about the systems that are in place in Munster to make sure that this thing uh, didn't happen in the first place? Maybe everybody's ground with this. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe poisoning the well isn't something they're worried about. Maybe having a fox in the henhouse is not that big a deal. <laughs> Maybe they genuinely believe this idea that uh, the, the academy players will hear the heartwarming story and be like, I'm never doing that. Look at this guy, he's suffering. Look, look how guilty he feels. I'm never, ever going near that. Maybe they, maybe they actually believe that. Um, oh. Which would be a uh, very, well, um, clearly they don't believe that, but let's just keep that in mind for just a second, that somebody out there probably thinks, like, I, I know Conor Murray, what else was he going to say yesterday? But when he says that, I'm sure somebody believes him. That it's like, yeah, the academy players will be deterred but from using it because they hear this horror story. Horror I'd say- story. I'd say the prodigal son was the uh, worst ever parable to tell Irish people because ultimately most Irish people look at the parable of the prodigal son and think, Jesus, a lifetime spent carousing. Woohoo! Well, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do. Yeah, there, it's, it's a great parable, really. Maybe it was the best parable told to Irish people. And all I have to do at the end is apologise. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean it. And, like, and I get the fatted calf as well. That <laughs> I mean, it's come a win, on. win, 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 win. The, the, like, the short term gains and the long term gains. They're all yours. Favorite. Like, ultimately, so the, the good son slash brother spends his life toiling and ultimately saves this cow and has to give it to that prick who went around the world carousing, having, having the crack. Yeah. I what like, are you going to do? I'm trying to think what, what other parables apply to this. Uh, like. Listen to that story and tell me which of these characters you'd rather be. The one who spends his life constantly toiling in the fields, breaking his back, living the good life, or the guy who, you know. So I don't think there was an anabolic steroid involved in the, I mean, who in knows? the prodigal son. There could have been. Who knows? Maybe, uh, who, who was that? I, I suppose all, all the four uh, big, big ones wrote a bit about it today. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I mean, I, my knowledge of the Gospels is pretty limited. Yeah, but I presume that something as infamous as the prodigal son should surely have been written by all four of them. I'm sure Jesus was in on the act as well. So Probably only one of those guys uh, was the clever one to go, and most cultures are like, oh yeah, geez, that's great. I mean, that guy, he's the stand-up guy. In Ireland, it's like, ooh, sin, sin, sin. Woohoo, redeemed. I wonder do the prophets, when they're writing the gospel or whatever, do they look into a time machine and they're like, Gerbank Grobler is going to dope <laughs> in centuries to come. Let's write a parable that will apply perfectly to the situation. And they came up with the prodigal son. Daniel Brady sees the good in the situation. He says it's an opportunity for the IRFU to present their anti-doping framework using a real-life case study as opposed to a press release that nobody would read in the first place. They could turn Ireland into a positive example for clean rugby and set a strong precedent. They could, I guess... You just need to explain to me what you think the course of action which would show them having this precedent. And for me, that is pay up the contract and say, maybe we suffer as a team in Munster this year, but long term, our culture benefits from us saying we made a mistake. And it's fine to make mistakes. People make mistakes. That's grand. But like the, okay, that was a bit of a screw up. We've decided we're going to learn from it. Everybody moves on. We write a report about it. And next year, when the signings are happening, Somebody spends a little bit longer Googling, what exactly was the thing he got popped for? Okay, no, that's, that's not acceptable. I don't know. Mkhitaryan. Yeah. Mickey. He uh, holds the keys in this entire dynasty that is Arsenal Football Club and how they're planning to move forward. My favourite team is Arsenal in 2009, according to Sam Sam, Champ Champ's little brother. He says uh, on uh, Facebook and UEFA.com, I like their attacking play and fast style. Moreover, Arsene Wenger puts faith in young players while demanding results at the same time. I like that and want to play there one day. Now, in 2009, he was a young player. He is no longer a young player. He, no. uh, he was 20 back then. So, um, 
I mean, I don't know. Maybe Mkhitaryan is one of those players who would go to Arsenal and and find the full expression of his true being. Maybe, but I highly doubt it's going to be any much anything better than the current saga that is this transfer story. I mean, Mino Raiola being involved in a transfer story is always good news. Expect him to pop up in talk sport any minute now. He's already been on record as saying that Sanchez is part of the Mkhitaryan deal, not the other way around. And he says that this is a great deal for Arsenal. So Raiola getting nice and petty there, which is what you want from him. Um, in terms of why it's Mkhitaryan now and who could potentially be influencing this move, well, did Arsenal not just sign a a scout from Borussia Dortmund, uh, the club who also hold the keys to uh, Aubameyang, oh, who yeah. nobody else is interested in. Why is it that Arsenal are the only club interested in this perceived world-class striker? I suspect that this world-class striker is no longer a world-class striker and that this guy uh, Sven Milsentat, if I'm pronouncing his surname correctly, that, uh, that's new scout at Arsenal, uh, is perhaps looking at the sepia-tinted resume that he has produced himself of bringing these great players to Borussia Dortmund who are no longer great players. There's a little bit of that happening, but... Uh, maybe, I, I, maybe Aubameyang just needs a, a change of scene, a change of schedule, and he actually recovers the form and is a world-class striker. Maybe he needs an Armenian playmaker. Maybe Mkhitaryan needs an Aubameyang in his life. With Malcolm on the left, suddenly they've completely transformed their team with three new starting forwards. And then Ozil and Wilshere playing out of their skin. Premier League 2018-19, Arsenal are going to win it. Chalk it down. Well, they'll finish at least fifth. I mean, that's the ambition these days, right? It's just wherever there's that steady line of finance, if, that, if that's still steady, they're, they're happy out. Um, on the Ronaldinho issue, we were at the Web Summit now 18 months ago and uh, Miguel Delaney was interviewing him and he was just loving life. I was just, I was just reminded of that. He was there, his, his brother was there and his brother, so you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito in twins, they're like split from the same egg and one is Danny DeVito and one is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's the, have you seen twins? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Ronaldinho's brother and Ronaldinho uh, are like them. Yeah, he is definitely the Arnold Schwarzenegger in the in the operation. And like, what are we talking here? Like, Ronaldinho wouldn't strike me as a particularly tall, bulky man. Oh no, it's the genetics. It's like he he won the genetic lottery, and uh, the brother also won the lottery of being uh, related to the genetics. Brother. Yeah, it's like the entourage follows him around, but he's the king of the entourage because like he gets to decide who comes and who goes. I'd be a part of Ronaldinho's entourage. It seems like incredibly fun. There isn't many professional footballers over the last 10 years that you're like, yeah, I'd like to be part of that entourage. Ronaldinho is one of them you would like to be part of. Yeah. And retirement's going to be a lot of fun for him as well. Anderson, I'd like to be part of Anderson's entourage for <laughs> Yeah. Well, the thing is, Anderson manages to get himself into these amazing little circles. I mean, the, the whole nine months that he spent with Cristiano Ronaldo living in his apartment, that's kind of like a twin situation. I know they're not related in any way, but the divergence in personality between Ronaldo and Anderson is a very interesting dynamic. I would love to have been a fly in the wall for those seven months. Like, yeah. uh, hey, Anderson, go live in that bed sit as Ronaldo opens the door with all his trophies everywhere. Although Ronaldo probably hadn't developed the absolutely humongous ego that would... Oh, he had, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not the story. Himself and, himself and his best mate were training as kids at Sporting and uh, Ronaldo would sneak off at night to do extra sit-ups and your mum was wondering how the hell Ronaldo was progressing and developing all that muscle and uh, they were doing exactly the same stuff but Ronaldo was like secretly whew, when your mum was asleep doing his 600 That's not ego though, that's just uh, perspiration. Yeah, look, I, I think that ultimately it, it benefited him and that's his character. There were some things about that Ronaldo-Anderson relationship which might not be fit for breakfast TV really? at this hour of the morning if you look back on the... Um, their, how they would celebrate things. The okay. presents would, Ronaldo would get them for their um, for scoring or for their birthdays. Remember, 17 slash 18 year olds. Ronaldo and Nani and Anderson, Ronaldo was kind of the king of that little troop of young players. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder was Queiroz involved in all of this as well? Was it like the, the four Portuguese uh, members of uh, Manchester United staff and squad Do just partying together? Whatever these prizes are that you were, ta were talking about. I don't about. think Carlos Queiroz was involved. I'm absolutely 100% sure he wasn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not leaving, I'm not leaving that little fantasy die. No, just Google it there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so Andy Lee was on the show last night and um, we were talking yesterday about uh, Daniel Jacobs and the fact that maybe Katie Taylor was going to end up being on the undercard of that and the possibility that Spike O'Sullivan was in line for that fight. Eddie Hearn came out yesterday and went, well, look, if Spike O'Sullivan's not going to make this fight at whatever the price Eddie Hearn wants it made, I suspect... Um, then Andy Lee is suddenly in the reckoning for it and uh, well who better to tell us about whether or not this might be a realistic possibility than the man himself he was uh, just before I gave you one of my headphones he was saying that uh, 
Spike is well up for the fight, but that maybe his side, it's proving difficult to get the Jacobs fight. So if that's not quite working out, then Andy Lee could step in. Mm. Uh, at which point Andy Lee tweeted, that <laughs> is the fight I want at Daniel Jacobs TKO at Eddie Hearn. So... Uh, you were you're up for this. Has this come out of the blue for you? Were there some mumblings behind the scenes? Are you? Are you? Are, did they send you out? No, it's been mentioned a few times, even up last year and as late as like as early as October last year that a potential fight with Danny Jacobs could be in the oven this year, around April time. Um, but I was under the assumption that that it was going to be Spike O'Sullivan who would fight him. Um, it seemed like. They were in talks and it seemed like both sides were up for it. And the, last night I got a text message from Adam Booth just saying he's had contact from Eddie Hearn and there's a possibility to fight Danny Jacobs. Would I be interested? And of course I said yes. And that's basically where it is. There's nothing nothing Concrete. more than that. Um, I wouldn't have mentioned it only for Eddie Hearn saying it today in an interview. And uh, yeah, just let, let them know that I want to fight and let's get it on. Yeah, so um, that would be in Brooklyn at the end of April. What are we, start of uh, middle of January at this point? So plenty of time for Andy to get into camp and to get ready for uh, Daniel Jacobs. Uh, there was a relationship between them when um, Jacobs was a, a kid and uh, there was kind of a, a, a closeness between them. So, it, you know, it seems like this is a fight that Jacobs would want. And, um, you know, it's a big old, big old fight in Brooklyn. Yeah, for sure. I, like, I think when you're looking at it from a promoter's point of view, and you've got a choice between Spike O'Sullivan and Andy Lee. You're obviously picking Andy Lee. He's got a much bigger profile, um, like a much more successful career. So, so it's somebody who the Irish people are like, hold on a minute, how much are flights to New York again? Like People will fly over to watch this dual card between Andy Lee and uh, Katie Taylor, who it looks like is going to be on that card as well. So like I know we kind of take the mickey out of like a great night for the Irish in New York and all that sort of culture, but it actually could be. Andy Lee and Katie Taylor on the same card in Brooklyn is pretty cool. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll obviously keep you up to date with that, and as soon as the the news breaks, we'll have Andy right here on Off the Ball explaining how the fight came to be made or didn't, uh, as the case may be. As ever, we would like your feedback on the show. We'd like you to uh, share the show and tell your mates and uh, leave your reviews. We're also available on podcast. If you ever miss the show, you can get us wherever you get your podcast. Just search for Off the Ball AM, and uh, you can download it there. And remember to um, leave reviews and comment and share, and we'll uh, we get to those comments in good time as well. So if there's anything you want to get off your chest, feel free to email us am at offtheball.com for your considered thoughts. That's pretty much all we've got time for on the show today. Wednesday Night Rugby should be a bit of a doozer, um, a doozy even, uh, because Philip Brown is meeting the press in about an hour and a half's time, so no doubt there will be questions about Grobler. Uh, also meeting the press today is John Delaney, so no doubt there will be plenty to talk about with regards to the Martin O'Neill situation on Off the Ball tonight from 7 o'clock on News Talk. And just stay tuned to all our sports bulletins across the day on Today FM, on News Talk, on Spin, Spin Southwest, and 98 FM. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. <laughs>